Good morning, brothers and sisters, and happy Sabbath. <clears throat> As we begin today's study, we are going to be looking at some specific comments and admonitions of Mrs. White's, and that which she ties with the gospel prophet of Isaiah. I'm going to ask some assistance as we go through this. So please pay attention with the screen as we go through here. I will need the green verses that are highlighted to be read by others as we go through this. So before we get into our study, shall we seek our Heavenly Father's wisdom and his counsel so that we may more clearly understand that which he is saying to us today. Shall we pray? Gracious Father in heaven, we thank you for this opportunity we have to come before you this Sabbath. We thank you for the many blessings that you have been providing through this last week. We thank you as well for the rest from our labors and the opportunity we have to come before you. Now we ask, Father, as we join together for your blessing as we open your word. We need your guidance. We need your spirit's direction. We need your angel's protection. Help us now that we may learn so that these words given by the prophets may have an impact upon our hearts, upon our minds, and be revealed in our characters. Direct us now so that we may go forward, learning of you, presenting a message so that your character is more completely and fully revealed at this time in earth's history. <clears throat> for this, Father, for this opportunity, we thank you. For these blessings, we praise you. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, can someone please read Isaiah 58, 1 to 3? Well, <clears throat> cry loud, spare not, lift up thy voice. Like oh, a that's fine. Don't... Sorry. It's okay. I'll start over again here. Cry aloud, spare not, lift up thy voice like a trumpet, and show my people their transgression and the house of Jacob their sins. Yet they seek me daily, and delight to know my ways, as a nation that did righteousness and forsook not the ordinance of their God. They ask of me the ordinances of justice. They take delight in approaching to God. Wherefore have we fasted, say they, and thou seest not? Wherefore have we afflicted our soul, and thou takest no knowledge? Behold, in the day of your fast ye find pleasure, and exact all your labors. <clears throat> so now the answer. If we look at this carefully, we can see that they are accusing God unjustly. Behold, in the day of your fast ye you find pleasure, and exact all your labors. Now you can see that there are two sides to this question. They say on one side, and God shows them the other. Now in verse, in verse 4, Behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do in this day, to make your voice to be heard on high. <laughs> Here we see wickedness. We had better not do that anymore. 
Are we to be wicked at this time in Earth's history? We had better make a change in all these things. We had better not be accusers. But we had better take care of individual self to see that we are walking in the footsteps of the Lord. Shall we not have the strife and debating put away and come to a straight, thus saith the Lord? We are under control of God. We are not amenable to the opinion of men. But what is the opinion of God concerning us individually? What does this say to us today? <laughs> Are we not to repent and confess our sins and come into unity? Can someone please read verses 4, 5, and 6 of Isaiah 58? Okay. Okay, okay please. Um, behold, ye fast for strife and debate, and to smite with the fist of wickedness. Ye shall not fast as ye do this day, to make your voice be heard on high. Is it such a fast that I have chosen, a day for a man to afflict his soul? Is it to bow down his head as a bulrush, and to spread sackcloth and ashes under him? Wilt thou call this a fast, and an acceptable day to the Lord? Sorry, did you need number six as well? Yes, yes, please. Oh, sorry. Is not this the fast that I have chosen to loose the bands of wickedness, to undo the heavy burdens and to let the oppressed go free and that ye break every yoke? So now we turn over this picture. This in four, five and six is God's plan. Is this not a great promise? that he would relieve us of our burdens? Does he not say to us, come unto me, ye that are burdened and heavy laden, I will give you rest? Does he not break the yoke of sin upon us? And then we have verse seven. Is it not to deal thy bread to the hungry? And that thou bring the poor that are cast out to thy house. When thou seest the naked, that thou cover him. And that thou hide not thyself from thine own flesh. When you see the necessities of those who need help, relieve them. Do not hide away. Do not go away where you do not come in contact with them, fearing that your conscience would rebuke you. In this situation, God is presenting that which we should be doing. We should be relieving the burdens of our brothers and sisters so that we can come into the unity that is necessary to give this message. It doesn't mean that we should be sharp and accusing. It doesn't mean that we should be casting others out. God is presenting before us our need to be able to join together because it is only in unity that we are going to find the strength that we will need when others wish to reject the message that we will be presenting. 
Then shall thy light break forth as the morning, and thine health shall spring forth speedily, and thy righteousness shall go before thee. The glory of the Lord shall be thy re-reward. as in the morning. Is this not a wonderful thing? Thy rearward is the glory of God. When you acknowledge your brotherhood, <clears throat> when you are not so selfish as to bring yourself up with your own ideas and your own plans, this is a recipe for sickness, for despondency. It is a recipe for evil surmisings. It is a recipe for all that are inclined to speak works that will impress their neighbor of their friend. Shall we take that? Is that what we are to accept? <clears throat> Can someone please read verse 9? Shall I not hear him? I am ready to hear you. Seek, said Christ. It is just in harmony with what Christ said. Ask and ye shall receive. John 16, 24. There are no ifs or ands about it. Ye shall receive. Did you do it? Or do you go and tell your neighbor of all your troubles and all your difficulties? Can they help you? You want to be educated that you have got a promise from the Lord God of hosts. And you are going to take that promise. And you are going to depend upon it. And you are going to ask. For he has said, ye shall receive. He still goes on to give us the promise threefold. Seek and ye shall find. Opened unto you. Matthew 7, 7. Okay. And in verse 9 of Isaiah 58. Then thou shalt call. And the Lord shall answer. Thou shalt cry. And he shall say, here I am. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, the putting forth of the finger, and the speaking of vanity. Here Mrs. White is very clear. Because she's in full agreement with Isaiah. Are we not to hear God? Are we ready to seek Christ We are told, seek and we will receive in John 16, 24. Is there any condition if we seek him? No, I see it not. I see that if we seek, we will receive. Is this not important to us today? Then I ask you, why are you in such a poverty-stricken spiritual condition in the church? I ask you why you do not come right to the help of the master in taking him at his word and be co-laborers together, together. You forget the together, don't you? You forget when you have your burdens to bear, that there is a together. Laborers together with who? Laborers together with God, as we are shown in 1 Corinthians 3 verse 9. If we are choosing to separate from our brothers and sisters, who else are we choosing to separate from? What we want is to stir up the gift of faith that is within us. We want to take God at his word, and we want to rely upon him as a little child. 
He calls you his little children. And we want to depend upon him. We do not need to be barren and unfruitful, mourning and grieving, and sitting in dust and ashes. God did not tell us to do that. He has told some that they had better be sitting in dust and ashes to repent of their hard-heartedness and of their sins. Now, if we will put that away, we do not need to sit in sackcloth nor ashes. For God wants his people to come up on vantage ground. He wants them to stand as the light of the world. And that is what he wants of us. Gathers the divine ray of light and scatter them in the pathway of others. Isaiah 58, verses 6 and 7, which we've recently read. Let us work on the right side. Verse 8, there is health in working in this way. Are you trying to help others? When you are, the blessing of God comes upon you. The health springs forth speedily. Then he tells you to call, and he will answer. If thou take away from the midst of thee the yoke, from verse 9. Now we have verses 10 and 11. And if thou draw out thy soul to the hungry and satisfy the afflicted soul, then shall thy light rise in obscurity and thy darkness be as the noonday. And the Lord shall guide thee continually and satisfy thy soul in drought and make thy make fat thy bones and thou shalt be like a watered garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not are we willing to try this admonition this recipe what i ask you could not our churches do if they would come into the position as outlined in verse 11, also in verse 10? They would be like a water garden and like a spring of water whose waters fail not. What's the matter with the church? They are shut in with themselves and they do not get out of self. And they shall be of thee, shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. And they shall be of thee, waste places. What is that? Every one of you will see the light that there is in the law of God. Everyone who wants the light and will come right to the Bible will see that the Sabbath, it is the Sabbath of the Lord that he made for every one of us to be observed. It is the man of sin that has put his false day where God's law should be. It is the man of sin that instituted the Sunday. It is not God. And they that shall be of thee shall build the old waste places. Thou shalt rise up the foundations of many generations, and thou shalt be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of the paths to dwell in. You will read the 31st chapter of Exodus, beginning with the 12th verse, and you will see what it means to be a restorer of the paths to dwell in. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath. If thou turn away thy foot from the Sabbath, from doing thy pleasure on my holy day, and call the Sabbath a delight, the holy of the Lord, honorable and shalt honor him not doing thine own ways 
nor finding thine own pleasure, nor speaking thine own words. Then shall thou delight thyself in the Lord, and I will cause thee to ride upon the high places of the earth and feed thee with the heritage of Jacob thy father, for the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. Is this not plain enough? Let us think of these things. We do not want to come up to the judgment, keeping a day of man's invention, when God has given a day for us to perpetuate until he comes to take us to himself. And then even in the new earth, he says, from Sabbath to Sabbath, ye shall come up before the Lord. You will keep the Sabbath there. We do not leave it behind. We keep it in the new earth, the day that he created for man and all that was upon the earth. Now we come back to the chapter that we have been studying. Isaiah 59. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save. Neither is his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. Then why do we act as though it was? Why do we act so faithless? Why do we not take the right hold? The Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save. We have the right. He has told us to go forth in his name. He has told us to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost and to preach his gospel. Notice, please, that she says, we are to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Does this say anywhere that we are to baptize into a church? That's never been my reading. Okay. That now, they... was the one vow I bought. I, I still went through with it, but I thought that was. We all have to decide as we are going through this, are we baptizing into a church or are we baptizing in the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit? Are we ready and willing to offer and preach the gospel, the three-step prophetic testing message that develops two classes of worshipers? Or are we going to be like the Galatians offering a gospel that is not as presented by God? Now, when they rise up out of the water, they represent Christ rising up out of the sepulcher to proclaim over the rent sepulcher of Joseph. I am the resurrection and the life. John eleven twenty five. Thank God. Thank his holy name. We will praise him that there is a resurrection as we are raised up out of the water. What do we profess? We are dead unto the world. If ye then be risen with Christ, the hand of God, Colossians 3, 1. And you can bring light, and you can give him power, and you can bring holiness and purity and love, if you will only do just as God tells you to do. There is so much misery in our world because the commandments of God are trampled upon. It is high time that we take our position more steadfastly in favor of God and his righteousness. The Lord will help every one that will come to him as learners, as his little children. And if you come as little children, he can give you his wisdom so that he can entrust you 
with you the highest kinds of talent, that you can trade on those talents and increase those talents to the glory of God, to the salvation of souls that are ready to perish. Our life will be filled with light and with power. And we shall not be destroying ourselves in a way with the use of tobacco to benumb our brain sensibilities. We do not have one particle of brain to spare, not one cell to spare. Does this not clearly present that we cannot afford to be partaking with either tobacco, with alcohol, or with pharmacia? Does this not also show that we cannot afford to be partaking in theories? Are we not to rely completely and totally upon the word of God? We want every power of our brain or organ that we may use it to be wise in judgment, to teach transgressors the way of life, and to help them in every way to plant their feet on the commandments. Do you think if this world were obedient to the commandments of God, that they would be in the condition of strife and adultery and thieving and robbery and every kind of evil influence? It is the result of the transgressions of the law of Jehovah. If they had obeyed the law of God, they would have ridden upon the high places of the earth, and they would have been fed with the heritage of Jacob our father, for the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Again, she repeats Isaiah 59 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened, that it cannot save, neither his ear heavy, that it cannot hear. The question is asked, what is the matter? Do you not ask him? You carry your own will to the Lord, and you make a few words of prayer, instead of saying, Lord, I have asked thee, and now believe that thou wilt give me judgment and wisdom and correctness of ideas and that I shall not listen to the devil's sophistry, which is just now coming in. And mark my words, it will come in a hundredfold more than you have ever thought of to deceive, if possible, the very elect. Now the elect had better be sure, in the place of thinking that they are the elect, to know that they are the elect because they keep the commandments of God. Then you cannot afford to sell your brain into the liquor saloon. You can't afford to take a glass of liquor and then you go reeling around. Who are you? Are you the light of the world? No, you are a nuisance in the sight of God when you are in that condition. You have taken the vitality out of your limbs and out of your brain, and that sets your limbs staggering about, and how do you look before men? You do not care. You have the appetite, and you mean to keep it, many of you. Now consider that there is a world to be saved, and the money that is God's that you have put into that liquor. You will see it one day just as it is, that the day is fast approaching upon us. When it is said, let him alone, he is joined to his idols, let him alone. And of whom is this spoken? Have well, we not, excuse me? Well, originally Israel. Have we not read in scripture that Ephraim is joined to his idols? Let him alone.
are we to be as Ephraim or are we to be as Judah? Are we to be following God or are we to be following man? But we do not want to let anyone alone. We want now to let the light of truth come into your mind that you may see, that you may be saved, that you can take right hold of the name of Jesus Christ because his hand face from you. Here we have Isaiah 59, 2, 3, and 4. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. For your hands are defiled with blood, and your fingers with iniquity, and your lips have spoken lies, your tongue hath muttered perverseness. None calleth for justice nor any pleadeth for truth. They trust in vanity and speak lies. They conceive mischief and bring forth iniquity. Do we want God to hide his face from us? Do, do we want him to turn from us at this time? I would say no. What say you? We cannot afford to give the least countenance by keeping open the liquor saloons and giving license by law for them to deal in liquor when they know what it does. Anciently, God says, if a man keeps an animal that he knows pushes with his horns and he is not restrained but kills a man, that man's life is something before God. Christ bought that man with an infinite price. And that life is not to be thrown away. He gave his own life that every one of us might have that life which measures with the life of God. Now the Lord said, speaking right from the holy mount, if it is known that this animal pushes with its horns, is vicious and kills a man, that man shall lose his life and the beast too. Now think about that. Lawyers, senators, judges, if they are here today, I want you to think of it when you give a vote that the liquor shall be sold, that you are guilty with the liquor seller of all the consequences that grow from the disposing of that liquor to human beings. And for what they do under that liquor, you will have to give an account to God in the judgment. It will not pay. It's a fearful thought that those that approve and condone the sale of this product are just as guilty as those that sell it and those that partake of it. What we want now in this world is the little time that we have to make it just as near heaven as we can. And we are to put away every vicious habit. We have none too much brain that we would stupefy it with tobacco or with liquor. We want all the brain nerve power we have to glorify the Lord God of heaven. We want to learn the best way to reform those that are in sin and iniquity. We want to find out what we can do in the redemption line. The Lord God of Israel has a tender regard for us, and he gave his precious life. You will read in John 3, 12. How did Jesus treat that? Christ went through the baptism, although he was not a sinner at all. He never committed sin. It was on our behalf to set an example to every man living to come under the ordinance of baptism. 
he left us the example. There he goes on and reasons with Nicodemus. And when he tells him that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, he is making a point with Nicodemus of the importance of coming into a direct, personal, abiding relationship with Christ. And through Christ, that same relationship with Father Jehovah. Now we have come here in this part of the country and we have come here to seek in every way that we and me establish sanitariums to obtain money for ourselves? No, not that. It is to educate those that are sick how to get well, not to take drug medication that only leaves the poison in your system. But it is to use the very methods that God wants you to use. Deny yourselves. Do not indulge in gluttony or in liquor drinking. You do not need it. Here is an education to be obtained. How to keep your bodies in the right condition of health. They take the persons just on the borders of the grave and do their best to save them. They put them under a close diet. These persons will recover and they will thank God for their recovery. And what they have learned. We want to be health reformers and we want to be temperate in all things that we may keep a level brain and that we may know that when we see evil, we will not call evil good and good evil. We want to call righteousness, righteousness. And we want to call evil just what it is. The Lord would have every one of us to come under the control to the Holy Spirit of God. And if you will do that, the money that you will spend in liquor, millions and millions of dollars, you could feed the suffering, you could save that money, and could help the poor. We read and we have notices sent to us of the sufferings of those who are in foreign countries starving to death. We try to help them all we can. But America and the Southern field demand our attention, and yet we have sent missionaries to other countries to help them. I sent to one that was in Africa, a family that had a large amount of property, and they had the light of truth. I sent to them, now said I, you young people, I talk to you by letter. The money that you spend in indulgence in wine or any of these pleasure resorts, how much you might accomplish for the cause of God. I asked this son 10 or 12 years ago. I begged of them for Christ's sake to come right out of Africa. The mother was a widow. To come with her children, grown up men and women, physicians among them, and see if it would not break the spell over the young members that were heirs to the large property. I told the young man, I will make you my agent. I want you, whenever you want to spend any money in liquor, to put it right into a box, a denial box, that we have all through the South in every house, that when you want self-indulgence to remember that there are souls to save, and that we can carry on the missionary work among the colored people. I want you to consider this. Now I will make you my agent. I will ask you to save your soul in doing this thing. You are drinking and you are playing cards, and you are doing this and that and the other. He always claimed to be a friend of Mrs. E.G. White, and I dwelt upon that. You said that if I would write to you, you would heed what I told you. Now I tell you this. I wrote you three times. 
And then I received no answer from him. About three weeks ago, I received a letter from him. Oh, he says, Mother White, if I had heeded what you had said to me, I have lost nearly all my property. And now, what will you say about my coming now? I wrote him a letter, and I said, come, come. It is not too late. If you have lost your money, perhaps you can save your soul, your mother, yourself, your brothers. Come, said I. We will try to encourage you to place you on vantage ground. Now, what if he had taken that money and put it where it would have been of use in the place of encouraging other men? But he knew the truth. He repents of it now. And I hope that we shall see him in this country before long. <clears throat> I want to see those who are throwing away and worse than throwing away their money for these indulgences. What are you doing? God has given you your talents, every one of you. And now what are you doing with those talents? Are you using the talent of means and the talent of influence to lead others down to ruin? You cannot afford it. I want to say there had ought to be a temperance pledge circulated at every meeting that is held on the grounds where there is a camp meeting or where there is a tent meeting, that they shall place their name on record to be temperate in eating and to be temperate in drinking and to give God his own means. And that this temperance will preserve the health and this temperance will preserve the mind. God gives to every man and woman according to their several ability. Then if you have the ability, it is for you to exercise that ability to the honor and to the glory of God. We have a God and we want to acknowledge him. We want to do his will. We want to glorify his name. We want that every soul that shall come to the knowledge of the truth shall become strictly temperate in all things. How many times have I been called up to go and see a, to a poor tobacco devotee? Will you, he said, pray for me? Certainly, said I, I will. I knelt down and prayed with him. The Spirit of God came in and he was set free. In two weeks he sent again. I have fallen again to the indulgence of appetite. Will you come and pray for me? Said I. Yes, I will. Said he. This is the last time. It was the last. I saw as I was standing in a congregation in Michigan, a man with a little soldier's coat around him and all wizened up and his wife by his side and he had children. Some way the spirit of God impressed me to speak to that man right in the congregation. Now said I, my friend with the soldier's coat, I can distinguish him. I want to know if you will let alone that tobacco. If you don't, you will go to liquor drinking very soon. You have gotten about to the point now. Will you let it alone? In the name of the Lord, will you let it alone? Well, he stood up before the congregation and he said, that is a hard question. I will take it up. I may fall, said he, but I will take it up. I did not see that man there again. The next I heard, he was a Sabbath school superintendent. He was considered one that was doing an excellent work. This is a change from something that we see within scripture. When Christ said to those that followed him, you must eat my flesh and drink my blood, the response of those 
many of those that were with him said, this is an hard saying, who could hear it? And they walked no more with him from that day forward. Yet here is an example of one given to a hard question. He chose the hard question and the difficult answer. Is this not what we are expected to do today? One morning he came to my house at Battle Creek, Michigan and walked up with the tears running down his face and stretched out his hand to me. He said, Sister White, why, I do not know you. You have the advantage of me. <clears throat> you do not know that man with the little drawn up coat on. You do not know him, do you? No, I do not, said I. You are another man. Thank the Lord, you are born again. And you are another man. I am, said he. He was dressed nicely, and it seemed as though he was a head taller than he was before. Now, that is what the Reformation did for him. And we know that Reformation can take place, but you must not let your appetite make you a slave. There is money enough here among those in the congregation that will support ministers in the field, and there are those that offer themselves for the ministry, but we can give them all that we can, and that is all we can do. We are building sanitariums, and we are trying to bring these poor people, trying to break them off these habits, and, thank God, we meet with success. But I am talking more time than I ought to. But I want to say, how much money can be devoted to the missionary work to try and convert the poor souls that are now under the ban of Satan and impossible to break away? Now, if we go right to them and pray with them and for them, and they are converted, we shall see them and meet them in the kingdom of glory. These souls will cast their glittering crowns. If they are saved at the feet of Christ, then they will glorify him that have been washed in his blood, that they have been saved with the everlasting salvation. And they touch the golden harp and fill all heaven with the rich music and the songs of the Lamb. And there is nothing that enters into heaven that defileth. Consider that for a moment. Nothing will enter into heaven that defiles heaven. There is not a branch of the tree of life that bears tobacco. And hadn't you better leave it off right here? Because a perverted appetite can never enter the kingdom of heaven. We want you to have a place there. We want you to see the king in his beauty. We want you to behold his matchless charms. And we beg of you for Christ's sake to be reconciled to God. Teach your children self-denial. Sabbath school teachers or Sunday school teachers that have a pipe in their mouth or use tobacco, it is so disgusting with some of the children. I have known them to come home and vomit because it had spoiled their stomach and sickened them. Now these teachers, why not come right up to the help of the Lord to crush the demon appetite? God wants you in his kingdom. Christ paid the price for every soul there is here, and he wants you to be converted from all these sinful ways. And the money that you have used for tobacco, put it in the self-denial box and send it to us where? Where does she say to be, for this to be sent?
Nashville. Please understand this document, this unpublished document was originally presented in 1905 when she gave the warnings about Nashville. This document directly is linked to July 18th. And the money that you've used for tobacco, put it in the self-denial box and send it to us at Nashville, where we are trying to educate the colored people and send a little line that you have reformed. It would be worth more than 20 or 40 or $100 a week if one soul was converted from these wrong habits. Talk it. Pray it and seek to bring this reform right into your homes and let your children know that you are converted. And if it will not be the means of converting them, then it will be a new chapter in my experience. God wants you to come to the gates of the city of God with all your children, your little children, and he swings back the gates of the holy city. There he bids you welcome in through the gates, and he says, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Matthew 25, 21. Then who do these persons seek? They seek the very ones that gave them the straightest testimony upon rum and tobacco and all these selfish indulgences. And they clasp their arms right around their necks. And there, with face all aglow, they praise God for the testimony that they bore them. Let us wake up. Let us awake out of sleep, said Christ. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill. Let your light so shine before men. Matthew 5, 14 and 16. If you are lost, it is because you have ruined yourselves. Is this not a very direct, very pointed statement? Is this pointing the finger at anyone or is it pointing the fingers directly back at us? If you are lost, it's for all of us. it is definitely for all of us. If you are lost, it is because you have ruined yourselves. God has done all that he could. He has given you his son, his only beloved son, to die a most cruel death. What for? To pay the price for your souls. Now he wants everyone to repent. He wants everyone to search the scriptures. Put away your novels. Put away your romance. Put away all frivolity of conduct. There is a heaven to win and a hell to shun. Are we want to stand right by your side that you may win heaven? We want you to save your, your means that you devote to ruining yourselves and send it where we can labor for the colored people in America for they have a legacy to every person that is in America. And means are needed to establish schools to educate and train the colored people to work for the colored people. It is to train the people that we must walk in all humility before God and to stand in your God-given humanity and say, I have overcome by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of his testimony. What a work is to be done for us. Will you take hold of it? Will you help one another? 
and help in every way possible that you may have a right to the tree of life. Does this say that we are just to help ourselves? Are we not to help one another in every way possible? God will give you the leaves of the tree of life for the healing of the nations right here. What do you mean? I mean the Bible. I mean the words of promise. He will give you the leaves of the tree of life that will heal you from every false habit. And he will open a way where the peace and the glory of God shall be revealed in you. Now let every one of us see what we can do in standing up in noble dignity to glorify the God of heaven that has given us power to as many as received him to to them he gave he power to become the sons of God John 1 12 and the Lord help every one of us my very heart knows not how to let go of you my very heart yearns after you, and I pray that the Lord will open your understanding to keep as far away from the liquor saloons as possible and put that money into the treasury. And let me tell you, those that are with you here will let you know just where to put it so that it will have a converting power to spread the gospel all throughout our world. We want to send it to the foreign missions. I have been sending to these foreign missions all the royalty on my books that are sold in the foreign countries, thousands and thousands of dollars, and send them a, the means of these royalties in America that are sold in order to translate into different languages the many books that God has given me to witness before the world of what is truth. What has she had to say here? All the way through this, we are to repent. If we are unwilling to repent, how will we ever come into unity? Now, last week, we left off here. We were addressing Isaiah 59, 18, and 19. According to their deeds, accordingly he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense, so that they will fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him or shall put him to flight. The Bible should never be studied without prayer. How many times do we fail in this situation? We are to study, to open, to read our Bibles with prayer. The Holy Spirit alone can cause us to feel the importance of those things easy to be understood or prevent us from resting difficult truths of comprehension. It is the office of heavenly angels to prepare the heart to so comprehend God's word that we shall be charmed with its beauty, admonished by its warnings, or animated and strengthened by its promises. We should make the psalmist's petition our own. Open thou mine eyes, that I may behold wondrous things out of thy law. Psalms. 
verse 18. Temptations often appear irresistible because through neglect of prayer and the study of the Bible, the tempted one cannot readily remember God's promises and meet Satan with the scripture weapons. But angels are round about those who are willing to be taught in divine things. And in the time of great necessity, they will bring to their remembrance the very truths which are needed. Thus, when the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a banner against him. What kind of a promise is this? Is this a promise that we can hold on to, one in which we can believe? Oh, man. I have carefully reviewed the history of the past few years and the work the Lord gave me to do. Not once had he failed me, and often he manifested himself to me in a marked manner. And I saw I had nothing of which to complain, but instead precious things running like threads of gold throughout my experience. The Lord understood better than I the things that I needed. And I felt that he was drawing me very nigh to himself. And I must be careful not to dictate to God as to what he should do with me. This unreconciliation was at the beginning of my sufferings and of my helplessness. But it was not long until I felt that my affliction was a part of God's plan. I felt that by partly lying and partly sitting, I could place myself in a position to use my crippled hands. And although suffering much pain, I could do considerable writing. Since coming to this country, I have written 1,600 pages of paper this size. Please understand this letter, letter 17 of 1892, was being written while she was in Australia. 1,600 pages written. Many nights during the past nine months, I was enabled to sleep but two hours a night. And then at times darkness would gather round about me. But I prayed and I realized much sweet comfort in drawing nigh to God. The promises, draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. When the enemy shall come in as a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him who were fulfilled to me. These promises are James 4, 8, and again, Isaiah 59, 19. I was all light in the Lord. Jesus was sacredly near, and I found the grace sufficient, for my soul was stayed upon God, and I was full of grateful praise to him who loved me and gave himself for me. I could say from a full heart, I know in whom I have believed. 2 Timothy 1, verse 12. God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above all that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10, 13. Through Jesus Christ, I have come off more than a conqueror and held the vantage ground. I cannot read the purpose of God in my affliction, but he knows what is best. And I will commit my soul, body, and spirit to him as unto my faithful creator. For I know whom I have believed. And I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I have committed to him against that day. Second Timothy one twelve. If we educated and trained our souls to have more faith, 
to have more love, to have a greater patience, and a more perfect trust in our Heavenly Father. I know that he would have more peace and understanding. I know that we would have more peace and, um, and happiness day by day as we pass through the conflicts of this life. The Lord is not pleased to have us fret and worry ourselves out of the arms of Jesus. More is needed of the quiet waiting and watching combined. We think unless we have feeling that we are not in the right track. And we are looking within for some sign befitting the occasion. But the reckoning is not of feeling but of faith. What is this saying to us today? Are we to rely upon feelings? What say you? No, you must rely no. on Now, going to manus Manuscript 109 of 1898, another non-published manuscript. It is not wise to boast. Peter fell because he did not know his own frailty. Are we not today very much like Peter? Do we know our own frailty of character? Are we well acquainted with it? Or are we thinking that we are strong and that we are able to withstand these temptations? Peter's humiliation after his denial of Christ was terrible, but he was far safer in his repentant state than when he boasted. Then he depended upon Christ for strength and his restoration was complete. Peter was converted. When did this, tra this transformation, this conversion take place? Did it take place before the cross? Or did it take place after the cross? No, he, he denied him right up to the cross just about right to the cross so i would have to assume that it was was after i much agree a transformation of character took place in him he was no longer boastful but he knew not that he was restored to confidence until after the resurrection of christ the Lord had said to Peter, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have thee, that he might sift thee as wheat. But I have prayed for thee, that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Peter was given an admonition. And this admonition came with a warning. If Satan had been suffered to have his way, there would have been no hope for Peter. If Satan had been suffered to have his way, there would have been no hope for us. He would have made a complete shipwreck of faith had Peter earnestly and, and in humility looked for divine help. Had he been searching his own heart in secret, he would not have been sifted and tried. What does this say to us today? We that have such great light. Here is one that was standing with the Savior. And he was not searching his heart in secret. 
we are to be earnestly and humbly looking for divine help. We are to be searching our own hearts in secret. Satan cannot overcome the humble learner of Christ who walks prayerfully before the Lord. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard for him against the enemy. Christ interposes himself as a shelter, as a retreat, and the wicked one cannot overcome him. Peter fell, but he was not forsaken. What a promise is this for us? We have all fallen through sin. Have we been forsaken at this time? Have we been cast out in any manner? Well, n not by God. Isn't that what's most important? To me? Yes. yes. Amen, brother. In his great trial, the words of Christ were written upon his soul as with a pen of iron. I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Luke twenty two thirty two. This prayer of Christ in his behalf was Peter's only hope. We mark the course pursued by Peter. His fall was not instantaneous, but gradual. Self-confidence led him to the belief that he was saved. Are we ever to say once saved, always saved? No. Is it possible to forego your salvation? Yes. When we are self-confident, when we look more to man than we do to God, we then are choosing to forego our salvation. Step by step, was taken until the poor, sinful one reached the lowest grade and denied his Lord with cursing and swearing. When the crowing of the, crock, of the cock reminded him of the words of Christ, surprised and shocked, he turned and looked at his master. At that moment, Christ looked at Peter. And in that grieved look, in which compassion and love for him was blended, Peter understood himself. He went out from the company and wept bitterly. That look of Christ went directly home and broke his heart. Now Peter had come to the turning point, and bitterly did he lament his wrong. But that look of Christ spoke pardon. It brought a ray of hope to the erring disciple. In that look, he read the words, Peter, I am sorry for you. Because you are sorry and repent, I forgive your transgression. The fruit of repentance is not a self-confidence that springs into life in a moment, saying, I am saved, I am saved. With Peter, there was a genuine work of repentance. His sorrow was as intense as had been his denial. Thus it will be with every truly converted soul. All who have known and opposed the truth should be careful lest their words and their actions Satan gain an advantage over them and lead them in their insecurity to boast, I am saved. There is to be no flippancy in the confession of sin. God desires truth in the inward parts. 
some market victories have been gained where the enemy had planned to undermine our institutions by causing division. When a crisis came, the Lord lifted up his promise. The Lord fulfilled his promise. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. I must speak to my brethren nigh and afar off. I cannot hold my peace. They are not working on correct principles. Those who stand in responsible positions must not feel that their position of importance makes them men of infallible judgment. The Redeemer has come to Zion. Unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, just as Paul has noted, and so all Israel shall be saved. As it is written, there shall come out of Sion the deliverer and shall turn away ungodliness from Jacob. We are not men and women of infallible judgment. The church and its leaders are not men and women of infallible judgment. We are not to feel at any point in time that our judgment is above that of our creator. I have a message from God to the sinners in Zion, the ones whom Christ addressed. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Revelation 3.2 You need to offer always the sacred fire for then Christ's works, his love, his mercy, his righteousness will ascend before God as a cloud of holy, fragrant incense, wholly acceptable. But strange fire has been offered in the use of harsh words, in self-importance, in self-exaltation, in self-righteousness, in arbitrary authority, in domineering in oppression, in restricting the liberty of God's people, binding them about by your plans and rules, which God has not framed, neither have they come into his mind. All these things are strange fire, unacknowledged by God, and a continual misrepresentation of his character. As I've said many times, I am not here to point a finger. For if I point one, I have three pointed right back at me. What happened to Nadab and Abihu when they brought strange fire before the Lord? Nothing good happened to them. What had they been doing before they brought the strange fire before the Lord? They were drinking? Yes. What were they drinking? Alcohol. Wine. Yeah. So... Symbolically, Nadab and Abihu were accepting of false doctrines. They made use of strange fire in arbitrary authority. 
And as Mrs. White is showing here, that this is a misrepresentation of the character of God. So they had chosen to come before God in filthy garments. This is what happens when there are those that would choose to cast out others. Is this not a fearsome warning for us today? I have a message for you. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For if the, as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain cometh down, and the snow from heaven, and returneth not thither, and watereth the earth, and maketh it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower, and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goeth forth out of my mouth. It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. And it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. Isaiah 55, 6 to 11. Judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off. For truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth. And he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey. And the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. For he put on righteousness as a breastplate, and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing, and was clad with zeal as with a cloak. So shall they that fear the name of the Lord from the west, and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him, and the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn away from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. Isaiah 59, 14 to 17, along with verses 19 and 20. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed, nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. The Lord is offering us a covenant. Are we willing to accept and abide by this covenant? As did Abraham, as did Jacob, as did Moses. The church is to be fed with manna from heaven and is to be kept under the sole guardianship of his grace. Clad in complete armor of light and righteousness, she enters upon her final conflict. The dross, the worthless material, will be consumed, and the influence of the truth testifies to the world of its sanctifying, ennobling character. 
Now, when we're told this, that as for me, this is my covenant with them, we find this repeated and enlarged in the book of Hebrews. Hebrews 8.10, for this is the covenant that I make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind. I will write them in their hearts. I will be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. And then Hebrews 10.16, this is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts. And in their minds, I will write them. So how important it is, is it for us today? Not only to accept, but to abide by this covenant. The Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord, as for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord, my spirit that is upon thee, and my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth. Isaiah 59, 20 and 21. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee. And the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and kings to the brightness of thy shining. Isaiah 60, 13, 61 to 3. God has in training a people chosen, elect, and precious. They were once the children of disobedience. They were once disloyal to God, but now they are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that they should show forth the praises of him who hath called them out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. The Lord Jesus is making experiments on human hearts through the exhibition of his mercy and abundant grace. He is effecting transformation so amazing that Satan, with all his triumphant boasting, with all his confederacy of evil united against God, and all the laws of his government, stands viewing them as a fortress impregnable to his sophistries and his delusions. They are to an incomprehensible mystery. They cannot be understood by our adversary. How many times must we see those that have come away from the from liquor, that have come away from tobacco, that have come away from drugs, from pharmacia, from others that are now becoming a fortress impregnable to the wiles of the adversary. God hath declared in his word that our only hope is in him. He is our stay. He is our staff. We have no strength. Only in his strength. We can have no strength, but only through his strength. There is a work to be done for every institution in our borders. There is need of conversion from the principles of which have been coming in. Be determined to obtain the victory and to hold the victory. Let there be a turning and an overturning until every unrighteous principle is expelled. The living God will not justify any evil thing. These words were spoken. Judgment is turned away backward. 
and justice standeth afar off, but truth has fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. Yea, truth faileth, and he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey, and the Lord saw it. God walks through your business rooms, he is present in your council meetings, and it dis and it displeased him that there was no judgment. Isaiah 59, 14 and 15. See also Isaiah 59, 16 to 21. What does this say yet to us? What does this present before us today, brothers and sisters? How are we to act at this time? Nothing is hidden from God. The instrumentalities that should work with an eye single to the glory of God are acting very largely upon the same principles which in the past tarnished the sacred places of God. The plans of men are scheming and dishonest, not noble and generous and holy and true. When the sanctification of the Spirit of God becomes a controlling power, then God will bless his people. We, as a people, in a moment can be justified. It is the work of a lifetime to become sanctified. Sanctification cannot be complete unless the Spirit of God becomes a controlling power. When that happens, God will then bless his people. Is this not clear to us today? The record shows the power that prayers of faith thought offered by frail human beings have with God. The earnest cry, I will not let thee go except thou bless me, has saved many a soul. If there were far more urgent intercessions for perishing souls, there would be far more souls saved. Of Christ it is written, he saw that there was no man and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore, his arm brought salvation unto him and his righteousness. It sustained him. Isaiah 59, 16. He wondered that there were no man who would lay hold by living faith of his fellow men and save them with fear, pulling them out of the fire, hating even the garments spotted by the flesh. He put on righteousness as a breastplate. He was not covering up sins of the transgressor, but was making the most determined effort to bring the sinner to a sense of the sinfulness of sin. He, his own hatred of sin, his own integrity brought salvation to the sinner. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and an helmet of salvation upon his head. And he put on the garments of vengeance for clothing and was clad with zeal as a cloak. According to their deeds, accordingly, he will repay fury to his adversaries, recompense to his enemies, to the islands he will repay recompense. So shall they fear the name of the Lord from the west and his glory from the rising of the sun. When the enemy shall come in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord shall lift up a standard against him. And the Redeemer shall come to Zion, and unto them that turn from transgression in Jacob, saith the Lord. As for me, this is my covenant with them, saith the Lord. My spirit that is upon thee, my words which I have put in thy mouth, shall not depart out of thy mouth, nor out of the mouth of thy seed nor out of the mouth of thy seed seed, saith the Lord, from henceforth and forever. 
what kind of an interest have you at the throne of grace? Make the most of it for the sake of the church. Improve every particle of your advantage for the sake of the erring ones. Call sin by its right name. Do not help the sinner to cloak his sin under a deceptive garment of righteousness. Many today are doing this. The sinner is not saved by smooth words, which palm off sin as righteousness. The teachers of truth are to reprove, to rebuke, and to exhort all with long suffering and with doctrine. All of this is necessary for us today. This concludes our study from what has been written in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59. Have you any questions or comments at this time? Do you have any concerns with what we have just read? I keep getting the words words of David coming to me, create in me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit within me. And I'm also thinking that a lot of the stuff that she was talking about, I mean, in those days, it was so clear, smoking tobacco, for example, or drinking booze, but it's other things that we're doing to ourselves that affect not only us, but those around us. It's those hidden secret sins that we might we might not be aware of, but God is. And that's that is, why, you know, Psalm 39, 23 and 24 is still so important, you know, where we ask God to search us and remove the very root of sin so we can stand before him justified and sanctified. It's a day by day battle. And then when when I, I logged in a bit late, but you were just reading about repenting and dust and ashes. And I thought. God really has a sense of humor because this is what I'm dealing with daily here. I mean, with that wood smoke, there's always dust and ashes. And we're also dealing with mold here. It's a real challenge. But I pr much prefer living here than I did in the cities. Okay. Any other comments today? Okay. I will repost this portion of the presentation since I have posted it one time before. And then I will post the first portion of today's presentation as well. Shall we now close with prayer? Loving Father in heaven, we thank you so much for this opportunity that we have to repent of the sins that have defiled our lives. We thank you, Father, that we can repent not only of our public sins, but of the secret sins. We ask you, Father, now for your guidance, for your blessing, for your watch care on this Sabbath day. Help us now that we may be those that may properly, truly, and completely represent your character to this world. Be with us now as we separate. Guide us in all that you would have us to do. Show us, Father, that which is necessary within our hearts so that we may become joined with you, directed by you, 
walking with you. For this, Father, we thank you. For this we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.